asked to do this TED talk, I said, let me sleep on it. My memory's not very good at the minute, thanks to the menopause. And I do tend to waffle and go off on tangents at the best of times. So I slept on it, and I woke the next morning, and the inner voice in me said, look, you've been given an opportunity to share what you've heard. Get your backside up there and get on with it. So I took a deep breath and thought, what the heck can go wrong? Well, 25 years ago, something did go wrong on the stage. I was in the audience, like you, and the performer asked for a volunteer, and I stupidly shot my hand up. And as I walked onto the stage, I realised he was going to pick me up and carry me across broken glass. It was at that moment I realised putting on the pair of tights with a very large hole in the gusset was not a good idea. <laughs> what with the very short skirt I was wearing, it was a recipe for disaster. So, he picked me up, and it was one of those carries, my legs were dangling down there, and we were at this height, and my skirt dropped a little bit, and as he's literally trying very, very hard, I froze, and in the freezing, I became dead weight, so now it's actually a really hard struggle for him. And he's walking barefoot on broken glass. I'm looking down, blood is coming out through his feet. Not my finest hour, or his for that matter. So, surely this can't be as bad as that. <laughs> so, to my story. Ten years ago, i just turned 40. Married with three children. Life was busy, as it is with kids. There's never any time for contemplation, decluttering your brain, chilling, relaxing, just thinking about life. Then death came knocking. Twice. First, he came and took my mum, and quite quickly after, my dad too. I was sad. Death is a great leveller. It makes you vulnerable. And I was wobbly. This was a very new sensation to me. I'd read a book called Wild by Cheryl Strayed, and I was envious. She went off into the wilds of California when her mum died. And I really wanted to do the same. It sounded fabulous. Wandering for days on end, nobody nattering in your ear. But sadly, that wasn't going to be possible for me because I had to be at the school to pick up the kids at 3.30 every day. So I need something practical, something realistic. And that came in the form of diaries. Amazingly, my mum had written 30 years worth. We found them at the back of her wardrobe. She wrote trite, often unintentionally funny, one-liners about everyday life. They were a bit Victoria Wood. I'll give you an example. June 17, 1998, the dog crapped all over the carpet. <laughs> August 2nd, 2001, rain, rain, rain. Well, she did live up north. <laughs> and 2nd of March, 1986, they found Mrs. Greenalsh in the canal. There was a void. I was missing my mum's input. Then I had an idea. There's plenty of women still left. Plenty of wisdom out there. Plenty of input. Why not ask them? So I had this idea that using themes from my mum's diaries, I come up with a list of questions and gather some women in. I started at the school gate. A few came back after the school run. We sat down and chatted. Eventually, I spoke to a lot of women, and they came from all backgrounds, all, all ages, 30 to 95, I think, in the end, and all geography. And I asked them questions such as, how are you? I love that question. I think it's my favorite question ever. When you're at the bus stop, when you're at the supermarket. Hi, how are you? Fine, thanks, how are you? Fine, thanks, how are you? Often it goes on too long. <laughs> Nobody, obviously, I'm being pedantic, you can't find out how somebody really is. But now I had the time 
I created this space to sit down and ask the person in front of me how they were. That question took, with most people, an hour to answer. I also asked, how do you think other people see you? That was a tricky one. What do you like about yourself? Even trickier. I asked about memories. And I also asked about how they do life and death, something we don't talk about very much. Listening really, really, really connects us. Because when you really listen to somebody, you connect with their heart. The mind moves out of the way and you're having a completely different sort of conversation. Often it's the space around the words. It's being present, just there, listening. I heard all sorts of weird and wonderful things. We're all interesting. The amount of women that said to me, you don't want to talk to me, I've got nothing to say. It's rubbish, absolute rubbish. I can guarantee not one person in this room is boring. Everybody has a story, no matter how insignificant it might seem to them. But what I found was the fear of invisibility was looming, if not already taken over. I also found that low self-esteem, lack of confidence and our worries were off the scale. I mean, off the scale. But I also heard that we are incredibly repetitive. The amount of times the person sat in front of me said, I bet you've not heard this before. I bet nobody else thinks like me, do they? I was like, yeah, we all sound the same. We all speak the same. And actually, that's what connects us, really. We're not that different. We really, really aren't. When you get to the heart of the matter, we're very, very simplistic. But it wasn't all doom and gloom. I heard some really, really lovely, interesting descriptions, interesting stories. And it was always surprising, because you just never knew what was going to come out of someone's mouth. Listen to this. One woman said this when I asked her about the weather. I dislike autumn. It's dishonest because it signifies decay and death. But it's disguised in theatrical clothes, in all its glory and colour. It's fake, but it's death. When you look at spring, it's promise, new beginnings, another chance, rebirth. Summer is greedy, ripe, no surprises. With summer, it's out there. I like the winter, the naked trees. At least it's honest. Wow, I only asked her about the weather. And it was so poetic, it just literally, she opened her mouth and it just flew out. And I thought, she's nicked that off the internet. <laughs> so after she'd gone, I googled, nothing. It's incredible how poetic we are. Another of my questions was, what do you think about life? One lady said, years ago, I volunteered as a prison visitor. I had to fill in a form as to why I wanted to help. My analogy was this, life is like a meadow. There's a gate at each end. We all make our way through the first one and head towards the other. Some will fall in the mud. Some will stop and smell the flowers. Why not help and encourage the ones who are struggling? Hold out your hand to the others coming through at the same time as you. Life isn't about how well you do. It's about how well everyone does. So you can see I was gathering some life-affirming, inspirational stuff and not a penny spent in the self-help department at the bookshop. <laughs> all I had to do was ask the person and it all came flowing out. Women know stuff, and I'm not saying men don't. I haven't had the chance to ask them yet, but I'm on it. That's my next project. We are wise. Listen to this from a 72-year-old. I love life. I don't think a day goes by when I don't say thank you. I'm so lucky. I still think I'm 21. Life is just a circle. You start as a baby, move around the circle, and come back to being that child. I feel a kind of elation. I asked them about memories too, and I know we've all got millions of them, but you can be sure when you ask the question, there's one lurking. 
Some were obvious, the registry of life, you know, the births, the deaths, the marriages. And some seemed to cause pause for thought, just not knowing quite what was going to come out. One woman said, I have many memories of my pilgrimages on the Santiago de Campostela Trail. I go alone most summers. It's the experiences you have along the way and the people you meet. I met a woman with a shaved head, a natural lady, knapsack on a stick over her shoulder, a bit Dick Whittington. She was a proper pilgrim. She slept under the trees beneath the stars, doing the walk in a very basic way. She had no fear. There were some tough memories too. Another said, when your husbands die, both mine have died at home from heart attacks. I've had to do the kiss of life and chest pumping twice. And another lady who worked as a traffic warden one day was giving a disgruntled member of the public a ticket. And he turned to her and he said, I hope your kids get cancer and die. I asked about faith, not in a religious sense, but I just wanted to know if we had any deeper feelings. This is my favourite. I believe everything happens for a reason. You have to be quiet to allow those feelings to come. I don't go into my mind so much because you can miss out on a lot. If you go searching with your mind, you become tunnel visioned and forget to acknowledge the tiniest things. I have a friend and we have an inner knowing. We don't need to speak. We communicate somehow without words. It's almost telepathic. There's no superficial chat. It's a shared sense of something inexplicable. And I like that. I loved listening to all these stories and these women. I could tell you many, many more expressive stories about nesting wrens or sweet smelling wafts of fragrant jasmine or the simplicity of how a fern unfurls its leaves. But as is life's biggest problem, we have limited time. But I do want to tell you one more thing. I wanted to know what the person in front of me thought about the experience of sitting there for most of the day, chatting. And this is the very reason I continue and will continue to do so. It's been very therapeutic. It's not often you get a chance to talk about yourself without feeling self-conscious. I love talking about myself. Even the worst things talked about are less scary. It's good to be honest and open about oneself. I'm very rarely truly honest. So four years on, and 107 women, 107 women later, I did eventually down tools and say, my project on the women is now over. I need to start on the men. But I'd heard so much loveliness that I decided that I would share what I'd heard in the form of a book. Now, this isn't something I've ever done before. I don't come from that sort of background. My spelling is atrocious. Um, and I haven't really written much more than an email my entire life. So it was possibly the most naive thing I've ever said. It was excruciating. My confidence plummeted. I was awash with worry, insecurities and self-doubt, just like all the women I've spoken to. But I persevered and I persevered and I persevered. And a further three years down the line, I did produce my book. So what have I learned? Well, take your time. Slow down. Time is precious. It takes time to understand life. When we're rushing, we're missing it. I'm 50 and I'm only just settling in. Assume nothing. Assume nothing about anyone ever. You've got no idea what's led them up until that point where they've met you in their life. And often our judgments are very clouded. Worry is a waste of time. Stop it. Just stop it. It benefits no one. And take your time to listen. When you feel isolated, lonely and down in the dumps, listening connects us. Not only listen to each other, but listen to yourself. 
Find out who you are. It's good for the soul. It's been said, generally speaking, you're not learning much when your lips are moving. And I know mine have been moving a lot. So I hope that you've been learning something and feel encouraged to step outside your comfort zone. It's not comfortable. That's the whole point. And I do think it makes you for a more compassionate human being. So remember, next time you're having a conversation and you notice your lips are doing most of the moving, stop. Listen. You'll be amazed what you hear. Thank you very much.